Who would ever think of pouring seawater into a volcano? It was an idea that led to disastrous failures in both the United States and Italy. But one day, Iceland decided to spend millions of dollars to pour seawater into a volcano. For the first time, people dumped 1.9 billion gallons of seawater, equivalent to over 10,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools onto a river of fire. For 160 days, hundreds of people faced molten lava with temperatures over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But what made them so determined to stop this volcano? In a battle between the sea and a volcano, which side would win? Let's dive into the details right now. This is Iceland. Just hearing the name makes you think of freezing cold. The country sits right next to the Arctic Circle and is windy all year round. Thick layers of ice cover the land, but underneath are massive pockets of magma. But it's not just snow and ice. You might be surprised to learn that on a territory about the size of Kentucky, Iceland has up to 130 volcanoes, both big and small. And today, more than 30 are still active. If Americans fear tornadoes and the Japanese worry about earthquakes, then for Icelanders, their true disaster is the giant volcanoes right in their backyard. Now let's zoom in a bit. Just 4.6 miles off Iceland's southern coast is an island called Hime. It's only about 5 square miles, but it's the largest island in the Vestmanajar archipelago. Right next to this peaceful town stands a volcano named Eldfell. For nearly 6,000 years, Eldfell was thought to be asleep. But in the world of volcanoes, asleep never means safe. And the fateful night arrived. On January 21, 1973, small tremors began windows rattled, but locals didn't pay much attention. Earthquakes are just part of life in Iceland. Then at 1.55 in the morning on January 23, a deafening explosion tore through the night. The ground cracked open just 650 feet from the residential area close enough to see from the window. Flames shot up fiercely with 40 massive lava fountains lighting up the night sky. In just two days, a cinder cone over 330 feet tall formed and fast-flowing lava swallowed the land erupting at a rate of 3,500 cubic feet per second, a terrifying flood of fire. But fate gave Jaime two miracles. Unusual, west winds blew toxic gases away from the city, and a recent storm meant all fishing boats were in the harbor, turning them into lifeboats. In less than six hours, over 5,000 residents were evacuated, leaving only a few hundred volunteers behind. In the end, only one person died. Can you believe it? The people could leave, but the island of Haimeyai had to take the full force of the eruption. The first houses near the crack were crushed by lava and hot ash in just minutes. In some places, ash piled up to 16 feet deep like a layer of black snow falling from the sky. Over 400 houses were destroyed, and dozens more were buried under thick ash. Have you ever heard of lava bombs? These are glowing red rocks that shoot up and fall like fireworks, but powerful enough to burn down an entire house. The thick lava flow averaging more than 130 feet deep and reaching up to 330 feet in some spots crushed even concrete storage tanks. One fish factory was swallowed, two others burned, and the power plant collapsed, plunging the island into darkness. Under the sea, power cables and water pipes were cut off, leaving the island almost completely paralyzed. After the evacuation, about 250 volunteers stayed behind. They weren't professionals, just fishermen, workers, and craftsmen. At first, they shoveled ash off rooftops, boarded up windows, and moved belongings out of the lava's path. But soon, both they and the authorities realized the real threat wasn't just the ash, but the lava flow threatening Jaime's harbor. The harbor is the heart of the island home to hundreds of fishing boats and responsible for 3% of Iceland's gross domestic product. If the harbor was blocked, the country's vital fishing industry would collapse. More importantly, the islanders would have no reason to return home. So what could they do? At that moment, Icelandic officials and scientists came up with a bold, almost crazy plan, use seawater to cool and stop the lava. It sounded impossible. How could streams of water stand up to an erupting volcano? But it was the only option. Previously in Hawaii and at Mount Etna in Italy, there had been some attempts to spray water on lava, but with limited success and only as experiments. This time, Iceland was determined to do it on a scale never seen before. The plan 
a network of high-powered pumps and pipes would draw seawater and blast it directly onto the edge of the lava flow. The numbers were staggering nearly 6.22 million tons of seawater would be sprayed continuously during the operation. So how did the miracle happen? The process sounds simple, but the effect was incredible. When massive streams of seawater hit the flowing lava, the water instantly absorbed. The heat boiled violently and turned into steam. This process sucked a huge amount of heat from the lava, causing its surface to harden into rock. As the outer layer solidified, the inside kept flowing, but became compressed, making the lava bulge and slow down. As a result, cool walls formed inside the flow, blocking the advance of the fire. Scientists call these internal lava dams barriers, created right inside the lava stream. But that's not all. Because seawater was used, when the steam rose, the salt was left behind. The result, huge white patches appeared on the lava's surface covering the area like snow on a black sea. Scientists estimate that after the operation around 220,000 tons of salt were left on the lava. Here's another little known fact, so much steam rose that it created giant columns hundreds of feet high covering the sky and forcing workers to labor in a burning hot fog. Temperatures near the lava could reach 2,000 to 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, the heat of molten steel. Yet workers still had to get close to install pipes and hoses. Once the lava watering plan was approved, the real battle began. In the early days, workers and volunteers sprayed seawater directly onto the leading edge of the lava. Amazingly, the effect was immediate. The surface hardened and the flow slowed, but the lava mass was just too huge. Clearly, they needed more. That's when a hero arrived, the dredger Sandy. This ship was brought in to spray massive waterfalls of seawater straight from offshore onto the lava. Sandy managed to save part of the harbor, slowing the advancing lava. But even that wasn't enough. To gain an advantage, they built cool walls right at the lava's edge, monitored every movement 24-7, and used bulldozers to create more barriers. But the lava kept coming. By the end of March, nearly one-fifth of the town was covered. The small island was slowly disappearing. Then, help arrived from across the Atlantic. 32 giant pumps from the United States were shipped to the island. Each could pump up to 264 gallons per second, enough to empty an Olympic pool in just a few minutes. When these water monsters started running, the lava's advance into the city began to slow, then stopped completely. But they still couldn't relax. The next plan was even crazier. Lay water pipes right across the lava field. Yes, you heard that right. Bulldozers drove straight onto the flowing lava. It sounds like a Hollywood movie, but the thick ash on the surface created a thermal shield allowing vehicles to cross. For the first time in history, people drove over a river of fire. On steep sections where vehicles couldn't go, workers had to do it by hand, dragging sections of pipe connecting them to the pumps in the harbor, working in blinding steam. They didn't just use steel pipes, they also used plastic pipes with water flowing inside, which were lighter and more heat-resistant stretching 330 to 650 feet deep into the lava. Every time a pipe broke from shifting lava, they replaced it and kept pumping. After 15 straight days, nearly 132 million gallons of seawater had been poured onto the fiery mass. And then, a miracle. A massive cool wall blocked the lava, forcing it to stop. Looking back at the whole operation, there's an important question. Why did the lava watering plan succeed spectacularly in Jaime, while similar attempts in places like Hawaii or Etna almost always failed first distance? The Eldfell Fisher was only about six miles from the town center and the harbor. This was critical. It allowed rescue teams to deploy quickly and bring heavy equipment to the scene in no time. If the lava had erupted in a remote mountain area like Etna, it would have been over before the plan could even start. Second, the speed of the lava. Compared to Hawaii and other eruptions, Eldfell's lava flowed relatively slowly. This deadly slowness gave Jaime's residents precious time to plan install pumps, experiment and adjust. Third, the ready supply of seawater. This was Iceland's natural weapon. All they had to do was run pipes from the harbor and pump directly onto the lava. No need to haul fresh water from elsewhere or worry about running out. 
Fourth, logistics and technology. Even though Iceland is a small island nation, it has a well-developed network of roads and sea routes. Thanks to this bulldozer's pump ships and all 32 high-powered pumps from the United States were delivered to the island in record time. After nearly five tense months, the volcano watering campaign finally came to an end. On July 10, 1973, the giant water cannons were shut off, there was nothing left to spray. The Eldfell lava flow had stopped, and the volcano's mouth was done erupting. Do you know how much water was pumped during this battle? The number is staggering 1.9 billion gallons of seawater. To put it simply, that's enough to fill more than 10,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. All that just to slow down a single river of fire. And in the end, it worked. The total material ejected by Eldfell in the eruption was also mind-blowing. About 8.8 .8 billion cubic feet of lava and ash. That number might sound abstract, but imagine this, just the lava alone would be enough to rebuild all of Manhattan with foundations dozens of feet high. An unimaginable amount. And now the most important question, how much did all this cost? According to official estimates, the lava cooling campaign cost about $1,447,742, back then roughly $8 million today. That sounds like a lot, but remember, if they had done nothing, the lava could have flowed for another month, wiping out all of Jaime and blocking the harbor, wiping out 3% of Iceland's gross domestic product. So really, it was a bargain investment for survival. To make it clearer, around the same time, the eruption at Surtsey, another Icelandic island, produced four times as much magma as Eldfell, even creating a whole new island offshore. But at Surtsey, people just watched there was nothing to protect. At Jaime, because there was a harbor people and an economy they had to fight. And incredibly, they won. After the operation ended, Jaime was not just saved, but became a global sensation. The event quickly became a media storm. Images of white steam giant pumps spraying seawater onto glowing lava appeared in international magazines, including National Geographic. And you know what? Instead of becoming a dead zone, Jaime boomed with tourism after the disaster. People flocked there to see the city that survived hell with their own eyes. New streets cooled lava flows, turned to black rock white salt layers covering the surface, all turned the place into a living natural museum. And now I want to hear from you. What would you do if you were in Jaime's shoes? Would you stay and fight or leave to save your life? Leave a comment below and share your thoughts. Don't forget to hit, like if you found this story amazing, subscribe so you don't miss future adventures and ring the bell for the next documentary. Trust me, there are even more surprises ahead.